Chapter 14 of The Alley Cat's Kitten This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Sherry Bell The Alley Cat's Kitten by Caroline Fuller A Visiting Lady First day on the train, we jumped set up in Eunice's lap like any other traveler, enjoying the view and spitting at the engines that passed. And when the sleeping car conductor came along, she was smuggled under the seat in the hopes that he might not guess what that innocent-looking lunch basket contained. But he did, because while he was examining the tickets, we jumps cut out of the basket and sharpened her claws on his leg. He jumped a little and said, I'm sorry, madam, but that cat will have to go into the baggage cart tonight. We never allow animals on a sleeper. Then I'll go too, said Eunice promptly. We don't allow little girls in a baggage car, he said with a smile. But she'll be so afraid, said Eunice in distress. She hates men dearly. I think she can defend herself, said the conductor, rubbing his leg. And in spite of all that Eunice could say, he carried Wee Jims off to the baggage car, where she was much disappointed at seeing so many locked trunks, when they might so easily have been nice open ones with pink silk shirt waist in the top tray for her to lie on. In the morning, Eunice had scarcely finished dressing when the train conductor came along, and before Mrs. Wood could stop her, she had seized him by the coat tail, asking, Oh, have you seen my kitty? Now the train conductor is a very important person, and as he has the charge of all the cars and all the passengers that are in them, it was not at all likely that he would know anything about a little girl's kitty. But to Mrs. Wood's surprise, he laughed and said, Yes, we just stole some milk for her out of some cans that were put on at the last station. Pretty cat, isn't she? I think that you must have a little girl, said Mrs. Wood gratefully. Two, madam, he answered. Tickets, please. After breakfast, Weejams was brought back and spent a happy day with Eunice and another little girl who was allowed as a great favor to help put on the crimson flannel tailor blanket, stitched with pink while the other passengers offered compliments and sweet crackers. That night, they had to change cars, and this time there was no friendly conductor to steal milk for Weejams, but a savage eyed expressman who charged seventy five cents and did not seem to love cats. In New York, Mrs. Wood was met by her sister-in-law, who had to follow her into a crowded baggage room filled with tumbling trunks and dozens of men to ask for a cat, please. What will you do next, Amy? said Aunt Maud with a comical look. I believe that Eunice will be utterly spoiled. Aunt Maud had no children of her own, but loved the little woods very dearly and explained to their mother quite often how they ought to be brought up. They were to stay a day or two with Mrs. Wood's brother, and then go to a boarding house in Monroe's to wait until their own cottage was ready, for Mrs. Wood did not believe in making long visits with a family of children. Weejams was more than glad when they left New York, for of course she had not gone to any of the theater and Eden Musée parties with Uncle Rob, or been invited to have an ice cream soda and it was not interesting either to walk in a tiny brickyard crowded with clotheslines, or feel one's way along a fence so narrow that if another cat came along, he either had to back away or stay and fight it out. But the boarding house in Monroe's attracted her because it had so large a yard, and she thought it would be pleasant to lie always on red velvet chairs and walk through swinging bead portiers that tickled one's tail but this was before she had met Mrs. Winslow. I don't care for your toy shell cats, do you? asked one of the old ladies who did fancy work on the piazza. No, Mrs. Winslow is white, said another. And a cat that won't purr for strangers, either, added the first old lady with a reproachful glance at Weejams, who sat back to on the steps. Mrs. Winslow will purr for anyone, said the other. In addition to this, it turned out that one of Mrs. Winslow's eyes was green and the other blue, while both of Weejams were hopelessly alike. It also appeared that Mrs. Winslow had nerves, 
I could not eat her chop bone in the dining room, with wee Jim's come and place eyes upon her. So wee Jim's had to be banished to the kitchen. But she afterwards fought Mrs. Winslow in the pansy bed, and when Mrs. Winslow returned to the house, her blue eye was closed so tight that no one could possibly have guessed it was not green. The Sith it's a bright cat, said Kenneth scornfully. But the other day after she'd eaten a mouse, she went around calling it to come back, just as if it was a kitten. They all sit in a row and admire her while she scratches her ribbon, said Franklin. They like to watch the bow go round under her chin and up behind the other ear. Then they say, oh, isn't it cunning, said Eunice. Children, don't laugh at the people in the house. We'll see lots of beautiful pussies at the cat show tomorrow, so you can afford to stop insulting Mrs. Winslow. But that very afternoon came another mortification for wee Jims and a triumph for the enemy. It happened that Mrs. Wood's room was supposed to be heated in winter from the room below, and one day when the register was taken out to be mended, she had folded the shawl across the hole, because as the hole looked straight down into the room of the queerest of the old ladies, it would naturally be very hard for Eunice and Kenneth to keep from trying to see what the old lady was doing. But she had reckoned without wee Jims, who thought, of course, that the nice warm shawl was placed there for her to lie on, and as fate would have it, chose a time when the old lady was sitting directly under the hole. Shrieks of terror from below sent everybody rushing to the old lady's room, and as her door opened, wee Jims shut up with a swelling tail and her enraged victim in pursuit. "'Gatch her! Gatch her!' screamed the old lady as Weejums bounded through the hall into the dining room and between the feet of a frightened servant into the kitchen. Scat now, scat, said the cook, cuffing her off a basket of clean linen into which she had jumped, without even giving her time to explain that she had stopped there merely to get her breath. It was against the rules for the boarders to come into the kitchen, so Weejums heard the voice of the old lady grow fainter and die away. But she was still angry with the cook for cuffing her, and spying Mrs. Winslow behind the stove, slapped her soundly on the closed eye. This was too much for Hannah, who loved Mrs. Winslow, and a little dipper of water from the dishpan descended on Weejum's nose. She stopped to hurl an insult at boarding houses in general, and bolted for the pantry door. Come out of here, called Hannah angrily. And in her haste to reach the window, Weejum skipped wildly through a pan of cranberry sauce, terrifying the old rooster in the yard by appearing suddenly before him with red legs. As Weejum had never cared for cranberry sauce, and always refused it on her turkey, it was very trying to have to lap so much of it off of her paws, and she had scarcely polished one toe when for no reason whatever a boarder upstairs put her head out of the window and called, Scat! This was entirely uncalled for, as Weejams had done and said nothing, but the lack of sympathy in it disgusted her so much that she slanted back her eyes and ears in the most Chinese of dignities and, jerking her tail stiffly, walked out of the place. She did not know, of course, that the boys across the street were getting up a circus so she would not have ventured into their yard. But they had always seemed like kind boys, so she was not particularly alarmed when one of them pounced on her and, holding her up, called to the others, Hi, come and see the red-legged cat! Red-legged cat! Red-legged cat! they exclaimed in delight. And the biggest one said, We'll have her for the sideshow, ten pins admission. Make the sign, Bob. So Wee Jims was carried into a kind of tent made of sheets where several freshly washed guinea pigs were whining in their box, and a goat with a cocked hat on bore the label of Only Genuine Bearded Wanderoo, fresh from Africa. Chain up the duckbill platypus quick here, called Bob, as a wretched little street dog jumped and bit vainly at Wee Jims' tail. Now then, big letters, he ordered, as the boys began to make the sign. Like this, I'll show you. Come and see the red-legged. But at this point, Weejims escaped from under his arm, and having stopped an instant to claw the duck-billed platypus, departed in a great haste from the scene. The boys dropped the sign and followed, but she soon left them behind, and no one who came to the circus ever found out who it was that had red legs. Weejims visited no more yards after that but skirted along the edges of lawns, and when anyone looked at her, shot up a tree. 
but as most of the people who appeared to be looking at her were really looking at something else, it is quite likely that she went up more trees than were necessary. Soon after she had washed off the cranberry sauce, a little girl drove along in a dog cart with a lady beside her and a group behind. And this time, Weejums did not run up a tree, because the little girl's curls reminded her of Eunice. Why, Auntie, it's Octavia, she said, pulling up her horse. It's Mrs. Slocum's Octavia. Someone must have stolen her and brought her way out here. My dear, are you sure? asked the lady as the child scrambled out of the car. Sure? Why, every marking is the same. The white nose, orange cape, and bronze lights on the paws. Come, Octavia, come to your kitty. I'll take you home. I'm not Octavia, mewed Weejums, but I'm tired of boarding house life, and I would be glad to visit with you until my family gets settled. See, I believe she knows me, said the child whom the lady called Marion. We'll take her right in on the train with us, won't we, Auntie? I want Mrs. Slocum be pleased. Yes, she was terribly distressed last night, said Marion's aunt. You know, she said that Octavia had never run away before and was afraid she had been stolen. I suppose she must have escaped from the people who carried her off. Dear me, it's fortunate we found her, and the cat shall begin in tomorrow. Mrs. Slocum would think it's pretty dreadful that they carried her out of town said Marian. It's natural that they should. She's too valuable to exhibit near home, said the aunt. Now Weejams had not listened to any of this, because she was watching the view from the dog cart and wishing the torn nose might see her. But when they stopped at a grocer's and she was bundled into a covered basket, she began to think that something might be wrong. A little later, she smelled engine smoke and knew by the rattle and noise that they were on the train, going she knew not where. After this came the jingle of street cars, and then a long smooth ride in a queer kind of carriage, driven by someone up in the air. Number Fifth Avenue, ma'am, called the men over their heads, and Weejams felt herself being carried up steps to a door which opened almost before the bell was rung. Oh, fiddles! said Marion. Is Mrs. Slocum in? We found Octavia only thing. Very good, miss. But the cat come home last night, miss. They've been bathing her today for the show. Octavia is back? Is here? But she can't be, Fennels, cause I've got her in my basket. Big pardon, Miss Marion, but I don't see how that could be as I just saw the cat in the hall. But if you and Mrs. Armstrong would come in, miss, while I speak to Mrs. Slocum. Then if Octavia is here, said Marion in despair, Auntie, what cat is it that we have in the basket? End of chapter 14 of The Alley Cat's Kitten